Thanks for stopping by the channel today. My name is Jason. I'm KC5HWB. This is the extra class. This is the final class in the three classes of amateur radio licensing that exist in the United States today. Some of my most popular videos on this channel have been the technician class and the general class, which is class one and class two, or level one and level two, if you will. This is level three. This is the final level. This is the top license you can get. And I want to thank the North Richland Hills Amateur Radio Club for allowing me to record this Zoom class they did at the uh, end of 2020, beginning of 2021. It was about eight, six to seven hour sessions, so you're in for a wild ride today. <laughs> uh, go through them as many times as you want to. Uh, fast forward, stop, pause, rewind, whatever you want to do. Play them over and over again. This is good information for those of you who are currently a general and wanting to upgrade to Amateur Extra. Thank you to the North Richland Hills Amateur Radio Club. Their website will be linked in the description of the video below, and I hope you enjoy the video series. So we're going to start on page 141 in the book. If you're following along in the book, we'll show the questions and work through the answers on the shared screen. Now let me get back to the shared screen. If I can find it. There we go. Share the screen. Where's the one I want to share? Is this one right here? Oh, when I first started designing FM radios, we had a guy named Chip. Chip was the guru of crystal oscillators. And at Motorola, the crystal oscillators all had temperature compensated components in them so that some wide frequency range from minus 40 degrees, either CRF up to 60 or 70, I don't remember the exact number, degrees C, which is 160 something, the temperature inside of a car you know, on a hot summer day. This guy's name was Chip, and it just happens that that's the answer to number D. What three oscillator circuits are used in amateur radio equipment? Let me get my marker started. Hello, marker. There we go. Three oscillator circuits. You can remember because Chip was the guy that was the expert on oscillators. Cole Pitts, Hartley, and Pierce. If you can't remember the three circuits and their names, just remember Chip. He was the oscillator guru. Now, referring to the diagrams in the book or the circuit diagrams on the page, one of those <clears throat> we posted on in the chat window, the markup that we worked through the last hour. So you can have those notes. And looking at the questions, this is E7H03 on page 141. How is positive feedback supplied in a Hartley oscillator? Hartley oscillator starts with H, which is what inductors are measured in in Henry's. So that would be through a tapped coil. Hartley starts with H, coils are measured in Henry's. And we get the feedback through the tap coil and the Hartley oscillator. Everybody can remember that one. E7H04, page 142. Uh, how's the feedback supplied in a Culpitz oscillator? You remember how we figured out the feedback path in a Culpitz oscillator? That's capacitive divider. In this list, it would be C, although the answers will probably be scrambled and it won't be C on the question if you get this one on the test, but you'll be sure to remember it because coal pit starts with a C and it's a C divider, capacitive divider. Has positive feedback supplied in a Pierce oscillator? We used a quartz crystal in parallel with the amplifier for the Pierce oscillator. 
they don't say parallel, but the, that's where you put a quartz crystal in parallel with the oscillator from output back to input is positive feedback. E7H06, which is on page 143. Which of the following oscillator circuits are commonly used in VFOs? Well, the Pierce has a crystal in it, so that wouldn't work for VFO. You're going to have to use the Colpitts and Hartley for VFOs, ones where the frequency is set by inductor and a capacitor. And that's how you change. You change one or the other. E7H12, page 143. Which of the following must be done to ensure that a crystal oscillator provides the frequency specified by the crystal manufacturer? The oscillator is on the right frequency. You have to set the parallel capacitance across that crystal makes it run at the right frequency, which you can use uh, back in the novice days, you put a variable capacitor across the crystal and move yourself a couple of kilohertz one way or the other. But it's the parallel capacitance to set the frequency of a crystal oscillator. E7H08, which is page 144. Which of the following components can be used to, redri to reduce thermal drift in crystal oscillators? We want them to be stable. We don't want crystal oscillators to drift. So it's NP0 capacitors. This is a Z, like zero. Some people call them O, but it's not O, it's a zero. That means it has zero temperature coefficient, which is one property of all components. They have a temperature coefficient. What happens to their value when the temperature changes? You want NPOs, which is really NP zero. Uh, E6D02, which is 144. What's the equivalent circuit of a quartz crystal? Remember what we said, it has motional capacitance, motional inductance, a loss resistance in series, all in parallel with the shunt capacitor. So what makes that answer different from the others? This is this one's kind of worded very tricky to throw you off so you'll get the wrong answer. I need to move the chat window out of the way. And John, I hope you're monitoring the chat in case there's questions that come up on chat. Otherwise, just unmute your audio and ask the question. Uh, answer B has almost all of that. <clears throat> uh, what does it say? Loss resistance in series is what it's missing. See the resistance here doesn't have the series term. So you have to remember the loss resistance is in series. Go back to that study sheet and see where that resistor occurs in that crystal model. Can I ask uh, a question? Yes. Uh, that, that last drawing that you did, that had the uh, oscillators uh, labeled and all the little arrow, circled arrows for the feedback. Mm -hmm. That one didn't come to me. Is that against the copyright laws or something? No, no copyright on it. It should be in the chat window. Well, I, the one I got doesn't have those details on it. Okay, then we, we'll email that as part of the notes email from the class today. Thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. We'll get that emailed out to the whole class. Um, and other answers C and D don't have all the correct parts. So it's the, the key to this answer is loss resistance in series. It has to say in series or it's not the right answer. Which of the following is an aspect of piezoelectric effect? Remember what we said about that? 
It's mechanical deformation of the material when you apply a voltage to it. So we have one wire on each side of a piece of quartz crystal and it gets deformed with voltage across it. That's piezoelectric. Which of the following is a technique for, for providing highly stable and accurate oscillators needed for microwave transmission and reception? For microwave operation, you can use a GPS reference signal. You can use a rubidium stabilized reference oscillator. Everybody needs to cook one of those up in your garage this weekend if you have a chunk of rubidium sitting around in a laser, use a temperature controlled high Q dielectric resonator. It's gotta be temperature controlled. Like a quartz crystal in an oven. Uh, there you go. That's temperature controlled high Q dielectric resonator. There's another name for a quartz crystal. So all these choices are correct on this question for microwave transmission reception needs very stable and accurate oscillators. Really? Well, why would he put this in the, why would they put this on a test? Really? <laughs> actually, that, actually, I think that's an important question for people who uh, may be operating uh, microwaves. If you remember the... Uh, a heat up dinner or something or what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If Some you, of the questions I wonder about. Yeah, I don't wonder about that one. There's enough ham interest in microwaves that uh, that's a valid question. Yeah, we're addressing all applications of amateur radio at all frequencies. And, and microwave techniques are way, way different than low HF and VLF very different so there's there's as, different aspects to all of all of the parts of amateur radio microphonics anybody know what a microphonic means that's where you bump your crystal oscillator and it changes the frequency because the crystal oscillator works a mechanical vibration of that crystal disc yeah, it's the uh, mechanical vibration which changes the uh, inductance and capacitance with the thumping on the cabinet of the radio. That's right. The change in that motional inductance and capacitance. I tested a uh, 220 FM rig uh, to see if the receiver was operating by using my grid dip meter and tapping the uh, side of the grid dip meter to modulate the, uh, the signal. And that told me that the receiver was actually receiving the microphonics of the, of the thing. So I yeah. knew it was working right, even though I didn't have any test signals anywhere. There you go, There's a good, there's, that's a good use for it. Usually you don't want it to happen. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't want it to happen, how do you reduce it? How do you reduce the microphonic responses? By mechanical isolation, you wrap it in a soft paper towel or a soft something. And if it's inside of a, of a temperature controlled oven, which is just a box, I built one one time in a frequency counter and the supply and the reference oscillator at 10 megahertz kept drifting around. It wouldn't stay the same frequency as WWV at all. So I had to build some resistors around it and wrap it in insulation and then pick the wires up off the PC board so it wouldn't have microphonics. Isolate the oscillator circuit from its enclosure and reduce the microphonics. Of course, John's method of testing won't work if it's not coupled to the outside case. <laughs> right. What's well, a phase lock loop circuit? 
what's the parts in it? Yeah, it's a servo loop. Uh, it's called a phase detector that makes it work. It's not any other type of oscillator. It's got a phase detector, the low pass filter, the VCO, and a reference oscillator. That's what makes a phase lock loop. It's a servo loop and it's very versatile. Which of these functions can be performed by the phase lock loop? Now, it doesn't amplify anything. Uh, it's not a digital pulse counter. It's not photovoltaic anything. It can do frequency synthesis and FM demodulation. Phase lock loops do synthesis and demodulation. What type of frequency synthesizer uses a phase accumulator, a lookup table, D to A converter, and a low pass filter? What would all that put together make? That's your direct digital synthesizer comes from those things. Lookup table tells you the phase differences and that the phase accumulator adds up or subtracts to make the sine wave output. D to A converter from the digital data and a low pass filter to get rid of some of the noise. That's a direct digital synthesizer. What information is contained? Information contained in the lookup table of a DDS. What would you have in a lookup table? It's amplitude values that represent the desired waveform. And for a radio work, it's usually a sine wave, although you can put in there the values digitized of any waveform and your D to A converter will spit out that waveform, whatever is programmed in the digital memory and that holds the lookup table. What are the major spectral impurity components of DDS, direct digital synthesizers? There's spurious signals and what frequency might be the primary frequency It'll be the sampling frequency because you're taking samples at discrete, at a fixed frequency. Sample and, frequency and all its harmonics. And all its harmonics, primarily odd harmonics, but it'll have even the harmonics in there also. So you have to have that low pass filter on the output of a DDS. Spurious signals at discrete frequencies. What's the effect of excessive phase noise in a receiver's local oscillator? This is what we had last week. Anybody remember? It combines with strong signals on nearby frequencies to make interference. We wanna get rid of interference. So you want local oscillators with very low phase noise. How frequently must an analog signal be sampled by the A to D converter so the signal can be accurately reproduced? This is Nyquist's theorem. At least twice the rate of the highest frequency component. Nyquist says 2x the highest frequency component is the minimum sampling rate in your A to D. What's the minimum number of bits required for the A to D converter to sample a signal with the range of one volt with a resolution of one millivolt? This is where you need a thousand because there's a thousand millivolts in a volt. How many bits do we need? You gotta have 10 bits. Eight bits that only give you 256 steps. 10 bits gives you 1,024. 
What function is performed by the fast Fourier transform, abbreviated FFT? What function does it do? Converts, doesn't convert. Well, it converts any signal. It converts signals from time domain to frequency domain. It doesn't have to be a digital signal. It can be an analog signal, but you're taking it from the time domain to the frequency domain. So DSPs can work on it. What's the function of decimation? That's where we reduce the effective sample rate by tossing out samples. And there's various ways of doing that, all digital. It's all, these are all digital signal processing steps. That's what was in our DSP block last week of the software defined receiver. Decimation, you reduce the sample rate. Why is an anti-aliasing digital filter required in a decimator? Oh, I don't remember talking about this one. What would be the purpose of an anti-aliasing filter? Any anti-alias filter removes high frequency signal components. Because if you don't take them out by digital processing steps, they fold back into the frequency range that you're interested in and it becomes just noise added to your signal. And once you add that noise in there, you can't get rid of it. So the anti-aliasing digital filter in a decimator removes high frequency signal components. Just remember any anti-alias filter, we didn't talk about the, the, that process, but if you don't take out the high frequency signal components, they get folded back into your frequencies of interest as lower frequency components adds to the signals you're interested in becomes noise that you cannot get out again. Once it's in there, it's there. That's one of the downsides of some of the digital processing steps. What aspect of receiver A to D conversion determines the maximum received bandwidth of the software defined radio? It's a sample rate. Sample rate determines your maximum bandwidth because the sample rate has to be twice the maximum signal frequency components. So if you're trying to digitize uh, audio signal with maximum three kilohertz bandwidth, you need six kilohertz sample rate at a minimum. So this is, this is turning the process around. What A to D conversions property, what aspect of A to D conversion determines the maximum received bandwidth? It's the sample rate. What sets the minimum detectable signal, MDS, for the SDR in the absence of atmospheric or thermal noise? It's, I think we talked about this last week, even. Voltage can reference. A, can I ask a question? Yes. What page are you on? Oh, I'm sorry. I messed up and didn't keep following that, did I? What page am I on? 150. We're on 150. This is question E7F11. I'm sorry. I, I left that off on page 150. We're just about done. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Minimum detectable signal level for the SDR is determined by the reference voltage level and the sample width in bits. Which of the following is an advantage of finite impulse response filter? This is question E7F12. But it doesn't matter what, but, but for finite impulse response filters has an advantage that they delay all frequency components of the signal by the same amount. 
that's the best way to get a good filter is you have to delay all frequency components the same. What's the function of taps in a DSP filter? They provide incremental signal delays for the DSP algorithms, which is a fancy word for computer code. Computer code implements the filter algorithms of a digital filters. Function of taps provides signal delays to implement filters. Which of the following allows a DSP filter to create a sharper filter response? Have more taps. More taps, better filter response, and that should be the end of it. That's the last question from page 150. Questions? No questions? That's all I've got. You did a wonderful job of explaining it. There's no questions. Or everybody's totally confused. That's the other possibility. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm well aware of those. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Got it. I'm done with this section. Let's see. Let's look at chat. See anything come up in chat? No, I don't see anything in chat. Uh, so I need to unshare. Stop sharing. There we go. Okay, John. Okay. Looking at the participants list here for a moment. Um, I have 21 of us assembled back. That's what we left lunch with. So everybody came back from lunch. That's good. Yeah, we did. Uh, AB5ZJ was in for a little bit. Yeah, I saw Tom pop in there earlier. Yeah, he, didn't... he sent me a message that he needed to leave. Oh, okay. Well, if he popped out, then somebody else joined. I don't know. I'm not keeping track. Yeah. Well, we, we've got our 21. We may have had somebody that left and somebody else came in. I don't know if that happened. If you're the new to this session, but we're here this morning. Uh, would you please uh, <clears throat> give your uh, name and call sign so that we can have it in the chat? Let's see. Also, yeah. also <laughs> if you're, you're new. Pardon me? Tom says he's still here. Oh, Tom's still here. Okay. Uh, yes, we know there are two Jasons. One Jason is monitoring and the second Jason is recording this for future posting on YouTube or something. So here's, here's uh, Court KD2 Sierra Papa Juliet in New Jersey says he joined a half hour before break. Well, we we Right as we broke for lunch, you probably heard this then if you were here right before lunch, that the, the chart I used for oscillate and synthesized section, we marked up during our discussion of it for the hour that we discussed and I ran out of time with the questions, is posted in the chat window if you'd like to download that. And we will also email that marked up uh, chart to everybody after the meeting, after the lesson today. Uh, John will get that to you in the next few days when yeah. we get, get things cleaned up from this uh, teaching session today. That's all I've got from K5GD. Okay, this section begins, runs page 151 through 174, which uh, moves right on from where we were. Uh, on page 151, there are a series of uh, 
equations. Um, and uh, the impedance of a uh, of an inductor uh, depends on the frequency and uh, the reactance of an inductor is measured in ohms just like in the ohms law uh, and you see the formula there 2 pi times the frequency times the amount of the inductance uh, capacitive reactance is the inverse of that formula. It's one divided by two pi frequency times uh, capacitance. And they give uh, um, inductance in Henry's capacitance in farads and frequency and hertz all of those are well the inductance and capacitors are huge quantities uh, I had a a uh, an instructor at Georgia Tech who told me that uh, told the class that uh, one farad capacitor would be as big as the hey John yeah can you uh, relocate your mic on top of your head again? Yes. Please. You got that popping sound again. I'm sorry. I'm happy to do that. I just wasn't okay. thinking about what's going on. That's much, much better. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and there's the... Uh, Current in a capacitance and a current in a an inductor are 90 degrees out of phase. Uh, they lag behind the uh, um, the voltage or lead the voltage, uh, so that uh, reactance is not necessarily. Uh, the same as resistive impedance. All of them have the general term of impedance. One of the things that we're going to talk about is resonance. And the first question kind of addresses that what can cause the voltage across reactances in a series RL and C circuit to be higher than the voltage applied to the entire circuit? And the answer to that is resonance. When the impedance of the capacitor and the impedance of the inductor in a RLC circuit are the same, you have a phenomenon called resonance. And what happens is that the energy that's stored in the uh, capacitance uh, electric field uh, gets moved into the uh, energy that's stored in the inductance in a magnetic field and it goes back and forth between the two. So at resonance, the uh, if the inductor and capacitor have no internal resistance, but only the external resistance of the R, uh, they null one another out so that the uh, resistance of that circuit the well the impedance of that circuit is the pure resistance so what happens if you do the ohm's law things with that you can calculate the current that's running through the thing by dividing the voltage by the resistance 
But then if you take the voltage or the current and multiply it by the reactants in the inductor or the reactants in the capacitor, uh, you can get a voltage that is much, you'll get a voltage measurement and that voltage can be much higher than the uh, input voltage across the, uh, across the whole circuit. And that's how that happens in uh, this question. And I did get my word stuff to work better so that I can highlight. Uh, what is resonance in an LC circuit? And that's a little of what I talked about. Uh, it's the frequency at which the uh, capacitive reactants equals the inductive reactants. And whether they're parallel or whether they're in series, uh, the phase relationship means that they cancel one another out as far as the uh, as their presence when they're at uh, resonance. So the current will pass at any frequency, high or low. So that's not the answer. The frequency that at which the reactive impedance equals the resistive impedance uh, has nothing to do with it. It's where the capacitive reactants and the inductive reactants are there, are the same and they alternate between storing energy in different parts of the cycle in terms of the electric field of the capacitor or the magnetic field of the inductor. Uh, what is the magnitude of the impedance of a series RLC circuit at resonance? You've got a, two terminals, you've got a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor all in series. And at resonance, it is equal to the circuit resistance. All inductors and all capacitors have some internal resistance. Capacitors also have leakage, which acts as a resistance. Uh, so it says it's approximately equal because those internal parameters of the real world physical things can vary the thing a little bit from the resistance. Okay, what is the magnitude of the impedance of a parallel RLC circuit at resonance? Again, it is the equal to the circuit resistance because in a parallel RLC circuit, the uh, inductance and capacitance uh, nulls out and becomes infinite. And what's left is the uh, resistance across the terminals. Okay, what is the result of increasing the Q of an impedance matching circuit? The Q is the Oh, my mind is turned to mush. It's quality factor. Quality. Well, it's called it's called the quality factor, but it's measure. It's a measure of the uh, resistance in the uh, coils and the capacitors that are a part of it. Uh, and if you increase the uh, uh, Q the matching bandwidth is, is decreased. 
I have a home brew uh, antenna tuner. And uh, when it's trying to match a, a, a high impedance uh, um, antenna, uh, sometimes the capacitor arcs because the uh, voltages in the L and C uh, get very high because the Q is very high in it. And the uh, bandwidth of that antenna tuner on 75 meters is on the order of uh, uh, 8 to 10 kilohertz. If you move very far, you better retune. Um, what is the magnitude of the circulating current within the components of a parallel LC res circuit at resonance? Uh, and the answer is B, the, the magnitude is at the maximum. Uh, AB5Z can tell you that when he resonates his uh, uh, magnetic loop antenna. Uh, he has to have a big vacuum capacitor when he runs all the power that he runs into that thing so that it doesn't arc because the current is at uh, maximum and the circulating current gets up there pretty high. And what happens with a parallel circuit, you're feeding a voltage into it and the energy with, with no resistance in it, there's no dissipation of energy. So uh, the uh, stuff just keeps circulating in the inductance and capacitance, uh, storing and depleting energy until the amount of energy lost in the internal workings of that capacitor and inductor uh, uh, equal the power input into that uh, coil and capacitor. What is the magnitude of current at the input of a parallel RC, RLC circuit at uh, resonance? And there it's the minimum the current at the input is is the lowest it will be when it's at resonance. That's what happens in a tube type radio when you adjust the capacitance to resonance you get a dip in the plate current. Okay, E5A uh, number eight. What is the phase relationship between current through the voltage through and the voltage across a series resonance circuit at resonance? At resonance, the the voltage at the terminal looks like a pure resistance. So they are both in phase. And that's a, a resonant LC circuit. What is the phase angle between the voltage across and the current through an RLC circuit if XLC is equal to 500 ohms, R is one kilo ohm, and the uh, inductive reactance is 250 ohms. Uh, here, the best way to look at that is to go back to the book uh, and look at the formulas that 
that he uses what page are we on hey, the form is on 155 yeah that's where I ended up um, On the bottom of 154, you see the the uh, diagram for an RLC circuit that is uh, there with a voltage source across the terminals. And The formula uses the tangent of the reactive and uh, resistive components. So you've got uh, 250, well, the 250 ohm reactance of the inductor cancels out the 250 of the 500 ohms on the XLC on the capacitive reactance. So you've got basically 250 ohm uh, capacitive and uh, 1,000 ohms uh, inductive and uh, my mind is not going to work on this this afternoon, gentlemen. <laughs> but you see his calculations there. Um, The tangent of the angle, he says, is uh, the resistance divided by the uh, capacitive, which gives the tangent at 0.25. And uh, A tangent of 0.25 is a phase angle of 14 degrees, and you do the inverse tangent formula to get that. Um, which is trigonometry and can be done on the calculator. And then he gives uh, And the voltage lags the current, so 14 degrees voltage lagging current is answer C. My uh, explanation of that is not all that clear. Does anybody have questions? I have a question. Okay. Um, it's my understanding from previous uh, information you've given us that these these questions uh, are going to be worded exactly the same way. And the answers is that not correct? That is correct. And that that, that they're not going to to uh, play checkers with the uh, with the questions at all in terms of internal information? No, you won't get a question that says uh, if the capacitive reactance is 133 ohms and the 
resistor is uh, four mega ohms and the uh, you won't get, these are the numbers that will be on the question that's on the test if you draw this question. Well, the reason why I ask is because the other day I studied this question and the, and the other one in similar pages with different numbers in them. And uh, I finally figured out how to know when to mark leading and when to mark lagging. Capacit and, uh, capacitive voltage lags current, inductive uh, voltage leads current. So anyway, uh, uh, and that, that is good on every question. And this book also includes all the questions. Is that not correct? From the pool? That's correct. Uh, they're really trying to help us, aren't they? That's one of the things that happened when the uh, uh, volunteer examining system went into place. Uh, back in the days when I was studying for my novice, you had sample questions, but they exactly the math might be totally different so you really had to work on the math here you can work on memorizing which answer well uh let me just say this um, i started out to be a double e and uh, my my math and physics background was not sufficient after two years i went i changed the music education <laughs> uh, because I had a lot, lot better background in those areas, and uh, as a conductor, a pianist, and a and a vocalist, and yeah, it's uh, amazing. I, I was yeah. disappointed that I I couldn't go stay with it, but uh, it was a uh, I was hitting brick walls. Sounds like it was not the place for you. No, it wasn't. But I'll tell you this much: uh, you guys know so much more about all this than I do, and I'm. Uh, it's really a challenge, but you know, uh, whether or not I understand anything that, that you say, I feel a whole lot smarter every time I get through. <laughs> Sounds good. We need to get back to the, to the task at hand here, or we will be, uh, running over time. Uh, Question 5B08 is the same question as 5B07 with different numbers. And uh, it uh, again has, uh, this time it's not 500 ohm resist or kilo ohm resistor, it's uh, uh, scaled back a bit. Again, you have uh, inductive and capacitive reactants that cancels one another out. So you get seven or get 25 ohms and you get it's capacitive. 75 from 100 gives 25. And the resistance this time is 100 ohms. If you do the same math that we did before, uh, Dividing the uh, 100 ohms by the 25, you get a tangent of, uh, no, it's the capacity divided by the resistance. Uh, you get uh, a tangent of 0.25, and that again gives you the uh, 14 degrees when you take the anti tan or the, the arc tangent uh, of it. And that 14 degrees arc tangent uh, calculated number is uh, voltage. And because it's capacitive, it's lagging, the voltage is lagging the current. Hey, John, I got a quick question. Okay. Now you said Capacitive is lagging, lagging, and inductive is leading. Yes, currently, current lags voltage in the capacitor. Okay. How do uh, how how is one to know that conduct uh, capacitive versus inductive? By okay. the, look at it like this: you've got a switch. I mean, you've, uh, you've got uh, a battery and a switch and a capacitor. 
But how, how can I tell we're looking at the question, the, the way you're looking at it, whether it's capacitive or, or not? Or, or, or I, I'm wanting to talk about the lagging. Is that the question you're asking? Yeah. I mean, how, how do I know if it's, you know, you're, you're saying capacitive is lagging and inductive is, is, is leading. How do I know by looking at the question whether it's uh, uh, whether it's lagging or lagging or leading, whether it's in capacity okay. or it's let, let, let me let me uh... comment. Just look at the value of the XC and the XL, whichever one is greater, that would de determine if it's a leading or lagging factor. Yeah, but oh, then okay. you have you the, the question as I understand it is how do you know that capacitive well, is leading and inductive is or lagging and con, inductive yeah. is leading? Let me let me give you a, a way to think about that. Think about a circuit where you have a battery and a switch and a capacitor. What happens when you throw the switch and connect the battery across the capacitor? In this example, it's we've got a capacitive and an inductor in the same circuit. So how do we know whether it's capacitive or inductive? Which is larger. OK, so whichever one is larger is it. So. The, the net reactance, not the resistance, but the reactance. The net reactance is the difference between the two, and whichever is larger, it will be that one. I guess, I guess, I like, I, was that Greg that answered my question? Yeah. Whichever one was larger. So, in, in, in question in, in B08, XC is, is 100 ohms. And XL is 75 ohms, so that's that's capacitive, so it's lagging. In in right. in, in B11, XC is 25, XL is 50, so that's inductive, so that would be leading. So that's how I would answer that question. Okay, that, that's how I would know it's it's leading versus right. the, versus lagging. Then, then if you look at the page, top of page 155, uh, Gordon put the Ellie, the Ice Man. A little, uh, what's the word, nomogram or whatever that is. So E L I is E before I. So that means that if it's an inductive circuit, your voltage is leading. And then ice is uh, in the, uh, current over capacitance. Capacitance is, or voltage is lagging your, your, in a capacitive circuit. It's a little nomogram or a little memory jogger or whatever. That's, that's pretty cool. But what, what, what page is that, Greg? Top of 155 in the paragraph there. Yeah, the Eli little, the little. Ice Man. Eli, yeah. Eli, voltage leads current yeah. in an inductor, and current leads voltage in a capacitor. Right. And even, even if you even if you remember half of it, like Ellie or Ice, you know, okay, if I have X of C is greater than X of L, it's like, oh, okay, that means I'm in a capacitive circuit. Which means, what does that mean? That means my voltage is lagging. In a capacitive circuit, okay. and then if it's not the case, then you, you immediately say, "Okay, then that means I have a higher inductance, so that therefore I'm leading an, an, an inductive circuit." Okay, I got you. I got you. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, thanks. That that that, that answers my that. That's exactly what I needed. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. That's the beauty of having twenty-one people in a class, gentlemen. That, that's why I didn't want to listen to the recordings. This is why I, it makes it, it, yeah. it. This is time well spent to, to do the class live. Yeah, and, and he tried to put a nice little picture on 156, which is even more confusing, but <laughs> because it's all imaginary <laughs> numbers. So, <laughs> so <laughs> if you want to get into the math and, and then the, that whole portion of it, but you know, it's, it's all vector analysis, so it's just really cool it's stuff. It's not my strong suit. <laughs> The, like the tangent of who? Yeah. Well, yeah, if you haven't had uh, uh, any trigonometry at all, when you start talking about tangents of things, you, you know, you just. Uh, I've, I've had trid, I, I've even had some calculus, but that was, we're talking 35 years ago, so. <laughs> yeah, in my case, uh, years ago. Um,
Okay, I, I didn't mean to hold a class up. Let's go. No, no. Uh, it's important to, to pick up these things and, and learn these little tricks. Uh, I'm, uh, and the other thing is sometimes uh, I make things so confusing when they're really simple. Yeah, <laughs> the rest, I, I the rest of you can, the rest of you can straighten me out. <laughs> I didn't get the whole battery thing there, John. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's the, uh, well, we did, yeah, it got interrupted in the middle, but it's it gets That's complicated anyway. I appreciate it. Um, okay, uh, we didn't actually talk about uh, E five B eleven, but the, it's again this time the inductant. It's inductive, so the voltage leads the current instead of lagging it. Um, what is the relationship between AC current through a capacitor and the voltage across the capacitor? Current lags voltage. Well, what does that mean? when one leads the other? It's, the phase relationship between current and voltage in a capacitor. Uh, reactance is 90 degrees out of phase. That's where the imaginary numbers that, we're, that you talk about get into. Uh, And I'm not sure we want to go into a lot of that at this point. Um, Are you on B09, John? Uh, yeah, E5, B09. Yeah, it leads voltage by 90, right? Not lagging. Yeah, the... Uh, The current's the leading factor, and it, it flipped the, the algorithm. Also, for the other gentleman, if you look at 154, there's a diagram of the ice and the uh, Ellie, where they're showing waveforms in that 90 degree lag without going into all the math and stuff like that. And that's where you see your phase relationships between the two yeah. pathways. So, I think that was for you, Don. Anyway, for 5B09, the uh, answer is current leads by 90 degrees. B10, 5B10, what is the relationship between AC current through an inductor and the voltage across an inductor? It's going to be 90 degrees out of phase. And it, the voltage leads the current by 90 degrees. When the voltage is at a maximum, the, uh, in the current is going to be at zero. And when the current is at zero, at, well, when the current is at maximum, the voltage will be at zero. 90 degrees out of phase. And again, that diagram on uh, uh, 154 uh, is a very helpful tool to look at and study on that. What coordinate, coordinate system is often used to display the resistive, inductive, and or capacitive reactive components of impedance. And the answer to that is rectangular coordinates. Maidenhead grid is the uh, 
layout for communicating uh, location on the planet Earth. A Faraday grid is a piece of metal between uh, windings of a transformer. And I don't know, it's been so long, I don't remember what elliptical coordinates are, uh, but rectangular coordinates is the answer to this. When using rectangular coordinates to graph the impedance of a circuit, what do the axes represent? By convention, by common practice, uh, the x-axis, the horizontal axis, uh, represents the resistive component and the vertical y-axis represents the reactive component. Uh, the uh, answer to that is A. Uh, and if you just remember resistive on the x-axis, uh, the uh, inductive uh, reactants will be positive and the capacitive reactants will be negative on the y-axis so that uh, capacitive reactants will show below the, the uh, axis and inductive reactants will show above the reactant, above the axis. Which of the following represents capacitive reactants in rectangular notation? And the answer is A. Uh, the J represents the imaginary number, which is the square root of minus one. which doesn't exist in the real world. The plus is the uh, inductive delta and omega are nice letters to throw in there to confuse some people. Uh, 5CO5. What is the name of the diagram used to show the phase release relationship between impedances at a given frequency? And it's phase relationship, and the answer is phasor. Phasor's on stub, Captain. I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, that was a Star Trek. I mean, that was a oh, the phasers in Star Trek. Sure, that was, a, that was a pretty poor attempt at a Star Trek joke. Sorry. Well, I, my mind was elsewhere, <laughs> and I didn't. I, I did, that did not compute with me. That's fine. I like that. <laughs> um, Venn diagrams, near field diagrams, far field diagrams. Uh, uh, are not the answer here. It's the phase relationship and it's a phaser diagram. Uh, where is the impedance of a pure resistance plotted on the, on the rectangular coordinates? Pure resistance is on the horizontal axis because it does not have a reactive component to move it up or down from the axis. Y is neither positive nor negative, it's zero. What does the impedance 50-J25 mean? The 50 is the resistance component, the J minus J25 uh, is the uh, is the J25 is the reactive component. The minus means it's capacitive. 
So uh, the answer is B, 50 ohms of resistance in series with 25 ohms of capacitive reactance. Ah, now we get to the fun stuff. Which point on figure E51 represents the impedance of a series circuit consisting of a 400 ohm resistor and a 38 picofarad capacitor at 14 megahertz? So we're on page 160 right now. Okay. So you've got a 400 ohm resistance. So if you go out the x axis to x axis to 400, uh, there are three points on the on the y axis in this question. One of them is actually on the x axis, which means it would be the 400 ohm resistor and nothing. The 38 picofarad capacitor at 14 megahertz. Uh, if you go back and use the formula, one over uh, two pi F C. Uh, I'm assuming that that calculates out to uh, about minus 300, about 300 ohms of capacitive reactance, which would be 0.4. And that is the answer to this, the one that they're expecting. That one is not hard to do because there's only one on that 400 point that's below the line down with the capacitive stuff. You get it as a negative. Capacitive. By convention. Below the x axis, any reactance is going to be capacitive. Above the x axis, any. Uh, so every, every capacitor is below? Every capacitor is below. And it'll, the point, it will vary with frequency. Because the reactance of a capacitor or the reactance of an inductor depends on the frequency that you're talking about. Does that make sense? Let's try again. Same diagram. Which point in figure E5-1 best represents the impedance of a series circuit consisting of a 300 ohm resistor and an 18 milli Henry inductor at 3.505 megahertz? Five kilohertz inside the band on 80 meters. Again, you go out and you look at 300 ohms, which is between the lines, there are three points. Point one is not that because it's capacitive. We're talking about an inductor, and point one is capacitive. So is it point three or is it point eight? And if you do the calculations, one over, let's see, uh, two pi FL, you will come out with a number and the 
cheat sheet at the top with B says it's 0.3. So it says that the uh, uh, inductive reactants for a 18 microhenry inductor at on 80 meters is uh, 400 ohms. I don't want to do the math, but you know, uh, just remember that 18 microhenry at 3.505. Uh, is larger than just off of the, just barely off of the ax the uh, x-axis. A little hint, it's since it's a two pi times your frequency, you just basically can do nice round numbers. Two times three is what seven. Seven times eighteen, or if it's a capacitive, it'll give you a ballpark. So, uh, what, what did I say? Seven times twenty is one hundred forty. So you're up around that, you know, the high point. You're not down at the, the baseline. If you yeah. just want to do quick rounding and stuff like that, so you can't be drifting down that low. So it gives you a gist of where you're going to fall in that grid. Yeah. And because of the way the questions are formulated and the fact that the questions themselves won't be changed. Uh, you can just remember that it's not the down near the axis, it's up a ways. Same diagram. <clears throat> Which point in E5-1 best represents the impedance of a series circuit consisting of a 300 ohm resistor and a 19 picofarad capacitor at 21.2 megahertz? 300 ohms out the axis, capacitive is down. It's got to be 0.1 if it's any of them. Uh, we're just lucky that we don't have a none of the above uh, question in here to confuse matters. Any questions about uh, that diagram and how it's gonna be used in the questioning? Okay, we'll move on. Just one hint real quick. Sorry, John. Go ahead. If, if you just scroll up a little bit. If you could go to, yeah. Like 0. 0.5 and 0. 0.7, the points 0.5 and 7, those are totally silly. So those would drop you out of the answers because you can never have negative resistance. So that eliminates at least one of the answers out of your equation. So it kind of narrows it down to where you're going to be looking. And then if it's capacitive or resistive, capacitive, you know to go down to that lower quadrant which is you know, the negative quadrant for Y. So then that kind of eliminates your answers. Because like multiple choices basically try to eliminate the, the silly answers and yeah. narrow it down to one of two, so. Good point. Um, yeah, negative resistance is an interesting phenomenon. It uh, usually results in the amplifier oscillating in some way. You, uh, I couldn't, I didn't want to interrupt uh, Wayne in the oscillator things. One of the engineering problems with designing oscillators is if you're not careful, instead of oscillating, it will amplify. And one of the problems with designing amplifiers is that if you're not careful, it will oscillate. And so, Oscillators that oscillate and amplifiers that amplify are uh, freaks of nature in some ways. <clears throat> Enough silliness. 5C08, what coordinate system is often used to display the phase angle of a circuit containing resistance, inducti inductance, and or capacitive reactants? Uh, again, we've got that same set of things. And in this case, except this time it's polar coordinates and phase angles are nicely shown in uh, polar coordinates. The uh, rectangular coordinates, uh, 
deal with uh, volume or uh, amplitudes of or the values of things. Polar coordinates deal with uh, values and uh, angles. Power impedance is described in polar coordinates. And that is by phase angle and magnitude. Um, if you go back up to this diagram and you start at the center of the thing and you notice that, uh, and you were to replace the grid with a series of circles, uh, the magnitude would be the number of circles out from the center. And the angle would be the arc between either plus or minus uh, the arc between the uh, x-axis and out wherever, whatever line the, the point happens to be. So in polar coordinates, you've got the total magnitude of the reactants. Uh, and you've got an angle. So you would have uh, 75 ohms of impedance and uh, at uh, 60 degrees or something on that order. Okay, which of the following represents inductive reactants in polar coordinates? And the answer is C, it's a positive phase angle. If that angle is a measure up from the axis around the great circle uh, to, the, to the magnitude, the uh, Uh, positive angle would be up, the negative angle would be down. So the positive angle would be inductance and the negative angle would be uh, capacitance. And uh, you're talking about an inductive reactance. So you've got a positive phase angle. That's that same question we talked about before in terms of inductance being above and capacitance being below. What is admittance? Admittance is the inverse of, of impedance. Uh, does anybody know the unit of measurement of uh, Admittance. If I remember correctly, it's Mo's. Correctly, it's Ohm spelled backwards. Mo's. And uh, uh, the Mo is the unit of resistance uh, for a term called uh, conductance, which is the opposite of resistance. Admittance is the opposite of impedance. And uh, you get it by dividing the impedance into the number one, dividing one by the impedance. So you could say the inverse of impedance, but you also could say the uh, reciprocal of impedance. 5B03, how is impedance uh, in polar form converted to an equivalent admittance? 
And I gave the answer to this one away in what I said about the previous question. The answer is B. The reciprocal, you take the reciprocal of the magnitude and you get the value of the admittance. Uh, but you change the sign of the angle. So if it, if the, uh, angle in the, uh, Um, impedance is positive, the angle of the uh, admittance will be negative and vice versa. The next question is what is susceptance? And here you get into the fun. It is the imaginary part of the admittance. Uh, let me take a stab at explaining that. The reactive component is um, the resistive component is along the x-axis if you're doing the Cartesian coordinates. Let's go back up to that diagram. No, that gets to, doesn't get the conversion to uh, to the susceptance. Because the phase angle of the reactants is 90 degrees off of the phase angle of the Uh, resistance in the circuit. The in reactants, the uh, uh, the math uses uh, um. I give up. What page are we on and what does Wes say about this? On page 162. 162 at the bottom. Sorry. Substance is the reciprocating, is the reciprocal of reactants, the value of a magnitude of substance. Susceptance can be calculated as the reciprocal of reactants using B equals one divided by X. However, reactance also has a sign. When you take the reciprocal of reactance, you can also flip the sign over. So plus becomes minus. So be sure, be sure to answer the actual question. Do not presume. Answer is D. <laughs> now you got the wrong question, right? B06. Question? Yeah, oh. B06. <laughs> Number six. So. Yeah, we're going to get to that one here in a minute, but really doesn't say much, uh, Gordon. So. Yeah, he does. He doesn't really explain it. Uh, it has to do with the math of the 
of the phase difference between the voltage and the current and the reactance that's involved in that. Uh, susceptance, you know, this is one of those things, why in the world does anybody need to know the definition of susceptance to operate a ham radio uh, transmitter or to design one? Uh, I do not know, but it's here. So, uh, susceptance is the imaginary part of uh, admittance. It's the uh, it's the reciprocal of the reactance in the circuit. Also, is more and susceptible to the current flow as well. Say more. I'm not sure what that meant. Well, because, you know, if it's a circular component, you know, has substance and um, basically the way I'm understanding how he, Gordon put put it in here, it has a substance because the, it's susceptible to the current flow, basically the way I'm understanding it. Okay, the, the word susceptance comes to the fact that uh, Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't really want to think about the mathematics of this to get into the depth of it. Uh, I think it's this just is a, one of those because you're I doing think, yeah yeah you're, you're doing your conversions basically a base system so it's moving to a different because the recipro everything's reciprocated. And so yeah. you're moving to a bit another formula system to basically compute things supposedly to ease the computational portion yeah. of your circuits and things like that. And it's, it's, it's all back to electromagnetic theories and stuff like that. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, can we take 10 minutes for a bio break? Uh, yeah, let's do, we've been at this an hour and a half. Um, Let's come back together at a quarter before the hour and we'll pick it up there. That's nine minutes. Sounds good. I sure appreciate your help. Well, that's what we're here for. And this question that, you know, uh, I'm not sure you just need to know that definition in order to pass the test. I don't know that you'll ever use it ever again in your lifetime. Well, I'm, I didn't ask about it, but I'm glad somebody else did. Yeah, sometimes, you know, in order to get into what that definition means and all of that kind of stuff, you, you get into math that is... Uh, uh, You're shifting your math. Basically, you're shifting what system you're working with, framework work you're uh, shifting. And it's just like when you go, like you're talking about FFTs. You, 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 I remember everything I shifted to the S domain and it made the math a lot cleaner, you know? Oh, yes. So, <laughs> and, and that's really what it is. It's basically you're shifting mathematical domains. Yeah, so Laplace transforms. Yeah, yeah, Laplace transforms are a lot easier to deal with than... Uh, yeah then uh, <laughs> some of the trig functions that you get into yeah. don't do the yeah. That's, that's, that's Yeah, that's what it is, yeah. And, it, you know, so. the other thing is uh, you can draw, you can create a mathematical formula 
for the movement of the sun around the earth with the earth as the center of the universe. But if you write that formula, the math is so complicated well. that uh, you would wish you had stayed leaving the sun as the center of the solar system. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that was disproved long ago. But yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, look at no, what I'm saying. What I'm saying yeah, is, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. what I'm saying yeah, is yeah, that yeah. you can reference everything to sure. Earth as the center. The right, only right. reason, the only reason we went to the Sun as the center of the solar system uh, was because the math was cleaner. Yeah, Kepler. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. It, there's no reason why you can't reference everything to, uh, you know, to a point, even a point on planet Earth, you know, my location on the planet. Mm -hmm. But the math gets so complicated. If you want to calculate the, the movements of, uh, of Jupiter, mm -hmm. or even more complicated than that, the the movements of one of the moons of Jupiter with respect to the earth and respect to the point where I am, that math gets so complicated so quick that you uh, uh, will very easily go and uh, quickly go back to putting the sun at the center. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, because things become ellipses rather than complicated, uh, highly uh, modulated stuff. That's the thing about math that you learn after you have uh, gotten into Laplace transforms and Fourier series. All right. That, that's why I said, like, even when you're doing the, the polar coordinates or uh, the Cartesian coordinates for solving those equations of where maps, and I remembered it's like just simplify it. So it's two pi, okay, that's three, three times the frequency. I got six, you know, or whatever, the 3.5. Yeah. Exactly. You know, so, okay, so I'm at 18, and then what's my thing? It's 20. So, you know, ballpark, and I'm at 200. Oh, that tells me pretty quickly where I'm moving on that linear line, you know. That yeah, axis. and you're not down next to the axis, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, the, the best teacher I ever had in school was my, uh, he was a civil engineering teacher for all of, uh, uh, what was it? I don't even remember what it was, like strengths or whatever it was. And he said, basically, if you pick a calculator up, you don't understand what you're doing. And, and you, you just look at everything and simplify the numbers and you can just, ball, you know, ballpark it. You know, sometimes, obviously, when you're doing engineering, it's, you know, you need the exact well, precision. The, but Yeah, and one of the things that uh, uh, I learned in engineering and has really uh, simplified my life is being able to make in your head approximations. Mm -hmm. And uh, very often I can do, well, engineers that I know, and uh, we all do uh, calculation of change uh, at the cash register by doing approximations in our head and then adjusting for the differences. Right. And it's yeah. all decimal math that makes it make it real easy. And you, you know, and you, and you get it, you get it much more, you know, 10 times three is 30. And yeah. if, if it's 10 times 2.8, uh, well, 10 times is the, you know, is simple, but, uh, those, that ability to approximate, uh, can tell you whether you got the right answer or not just looking at it, you don't, exactly. you, don't you know, yeah. I love going into, it's funny you said that for uh, like change. I love going into the, uh, grocery store and like I'm calculating, you know, what the changes in, or I'll give them, uh, you know, you befuddle me, give them $22 and 42 cents. They're like, why are you giving me this? It's like, well, because I want a $5 back. It's like, literally once I looked at me, like, how did you figure that out? I'm like, Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she punches it up and sure enough, it comes up five. She goes, wow, how did you do that? You didn't have a catch. <laughs> Like it's basic math, lady. You know? I grew up in the days of slide rules, and you had to <laughs> approximate to know where the uh, well, what the number exactly. Was. My point, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like you're not going to get that precision on a, a slide rule because you know it, it, 
I hate to admit it, but that's what I had in chemistry class when I was in high school, I mean, before we had calculators. I mean, I'm not that old, but I mean, I'm like, I still, and it's funny because if you looked, I asked the question of like, what kind of calculator can you take into the extra exam? And somebody shot back and says, well, if you want to use your slide rule, there's no problem with that. <laughs> and it's like, I'm like, well, that's stirring up some old memories. <laughs> I had a 12 inch circular slide rule that I could get four decimal points on. <laughs> oh, you're on the gurus. I never understood that, <laughs> that circular slide rule <laughs> until I, had a friend who was going through pilot school and I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a circular side roll. He goes, yeah, yeah, basically that's what it is. It's like, six oh. B. Yeah. Yeah. Then it just like, you know, the light bulb went on, <laughs> but you know, at 15 or whatever, never got it. <laughs> yeah. Well, a, a, you know, because of the circumference, uh, pi D, uh, a 12 inch rule was, equivalent to a, a 12 inch circle was like a 38 inch slide roll, straight slide roll. Mm -hmm. So who's, yeah. who's going to carry one a yardstick long? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, meter stick. Do we really need to take a calculator in for our extra our extra test? If you're taking it online, I think they give you computing on the program. Uh, I don't think you're allowed to use a calculator if you're taking no, it online. What, what they told me is you can use a regular calculator. You can't use a programmable calculator. You got to clear the memory. You, you got to show them that, you know, it's nothing fancy. I mean, you can have a scientific calculator as long as it's not a programmable type where you can recall something. And then they, I asked, well, what about like I'm on, on, on my Mac and I write, bring up the calculator program. It's like, well, they don't want you, it depends upon who does the testing for you. They don't like you switching between applications on your computer. So, because they don't know where you're going. You know, Cause remember they got to monitor it through a camera. If you're switching off the test and going to something else, they're like, well, maybe you're firing something else up. And, and, and the one person said, well, it depends upon the DE, how strict they are. If they see you switching, they can, you know, declare, hey, you, you left the test session. So you're doing something nefarious so I can abort your session. So. I don't know. I've never, I mean, if, you, if you're taking a test where they gave you all the questions ahead of time. Yeah. Well, you really shouldn't have too much difficulty with it. Right. Yeah. And that's why I like on these ones, I wrote, just wrote down for those phase angles. It's like 14. Just remember 14. So, and then you just have to figure out if it's leading or lagging. So it's yeah, and, and that's why I'm glad you went. I'm glad you piped in there, Greg. And you know, if it's you know what what uh, what answered my question on the capacitor versus uh, you know, uh, yeah, the inductor, yeah, yeah, God, I can't even spit it out. <laughs> you you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, that's what it was. You want those little cues. Yeah, exactly. basically, yeah, you know, the memory triggers. It's like, and that's why, I, well, I was just thinking it's like ham study. And, and, and I know some people are against this like memorization mode, but it's like the gist of it. And because I keep going through practice exam, exams, and it's like, I can't remember. So I was listening to some other guy on YouTube and they're like, remember, like, uh, what was it uh, for like the standard for DB? It's like, remember 3 DB? That's like the standard. Remember the, the noise floor of like 28 DB? And then I, the other one was like 74. So it's like, if you remember those three numbers, when you see it on the, the test, it's like, oh, that's 74. Oh yeah, that's my standard. So it's like, immediately I can get to the answer and move on to the next one, which may be more difficult. Right. You know, instead of trying to, you know, digest and trying to do the math. And because you know, back to my earlier sentences, if you grunt through the math and you get lost in trying to calculate the numbers, you're basically spending your time and then you're, you're casting doubt in yourself instead of like, okay, just remember 14 and now I, okay, half the equation's done or half the problem's done. And like, oh, is it a capacitive or inductive? No, it's more. inductive is higher. Therefore, I'm, I've got a positive number. If a capacitive is negative or lagging leading, you know, so. And, and a lot of the stuff that we're going through it here, I mean, I mean, it's nice to know, but in, in all practicality, how much of the stuff in here are we actually going to use? I mean, to, yeah. to operate our radios and stuff. I mean, it's. Well, yeah. the, the tube stuff, I mean, uh, John kept talking about, you know, Tube, tube stuff. I'm like, and there's even had questions about tube stuff. I'm like, 
I haven't seen it. I mean, I, I, I've just obviously because I've just gotten into the practice. It's like I'm like I don't even I'm not even thinking about two technology. I mean, to me, that's like you know when I was in high school, 1970s stuff. Granted, there's a lot of advantages to it, especially at the high power, but I'm not going to be running out the door and buying a kilowatt amp. You know, I, I just want to get something to get on the air, you know, so well, yeah, down the road several years. I do. Now, have- most of us, most of us now are uh, buying our equipment. My uh, enjoyment of uh, building stuff really grows out of my interest in uh, uh being the physical reality of creating a circuit, but I don't see myself ever building a uh, software defined receiver from anything more than a dongle that's already done that part of the thing and the software that uh, converts that to signal. Well, you gotta remember, well, I'm, I'm, you know, amateur radio, they're supposed to be pushing the boundaries of, of the radio electronics and to do that, and that's probably two, three, four percent of of amateur operators. You have to know this stuff. If you're not going to be pushing the boundaries, it's not that important. Yeah, and you push the boundaries in different things. Yeah. Uh, if you're a major interest, I have an interest in uh, microwave propagation, uh, and uh, tropo ducting is one of the major modes of that. I've had some experience with it. Um, and you know, then you focus on propagation modes and how they work and whatever. And in practice, you set up the, the, uh, the dish, aim it in the direction that you want to communicate. You've got a schedule with the guy at the other end, 600 miles away, and you work to find out what modes you can use to bridge the distance between the two of you. Uh, totally different discipline from uh, HFDX using the ionosphere um, and uh, totally different from uh, doing a personal design of a time shared uh, multiplexing on a repeater. And, you know, it depends on where your interests are, which of these things is important to you. And for most people, it's, I've got some kind of a UHF, VHF uh, uh, transceiver that will let me talk through the repeaters that are near to me or that I can take with me when I go to California so that I can talk through the Kingman, Arizona repeater from Los Angeles to uh, Phoenix or, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, We want to experience HF and the ionospheric uh, communications. There's nothing more exciting to me than the unreliability of uh, trying to find a time to talk to a station in Africa. And uh, so so all of these are part of the test and part of the exam. I think in some places, like on this question that's on the screen right now, we, uh, you know, the question has gotten a little too esoteric for the, uh, for most of us. Okay, let's get back to the, well, let me just ask, are there other questions or comments before we move back to the, process okay this is the question we left off with is susceptance and uh it's the imaginary part of admittance and just deal with that definition what letter is commonly used to represent susceptance uh, and B, uh, I don't know any mathematical formulas that use that, but that's the letter that would be used by engineers in that area. Uh, 
and I don't know how to remember that. Okay, uh, 5B05. What happens to the magnitude of pure reactants when it is converted to susceptance? And the answer to that is it becomes the reciprocal. Here you're talking about pure inductive or pure capacitive reactants. Uh, 5A10, how is the Q of an RL series resonance circuit calculated? And this is where my mind went into warp before. Uh, the answer is A, it's the reactance of either the inductance or the capacitor divided by the resistance. Q will be frequency dependent because in the, the reactance is frequency dependent. Why doesn't it matter if you have inductive reactants or capacitive reactants? And the answer to that is it's a resonant circuit. They're equal in magnitude. And it, Q is just a definition. It's the uh, the resistance in a high Q circuit is as low as possible, which is the thing to remember. Uh, a perfect circuit would be one where there is no resistance, and it would be extremely high Q. But if you put any kind of uh, load on that circuit and take any energy out of it, you're going to lower the Q. And if you understand the, the uh, uh, Q of a resonant circuit, then the is you're going to figure it's divided by the resistance, which is the lower piece, so that the higher Q is the lower resistance. All the rest of these won't make any difference. Okay, that question above was a series resonant circuit. How is the Q of an RLC parallel resonant circuit calculated? Parallel circuit is the opposite of what it was for the series circuit. It's the resistance divided by the reactance of either the inductance or capacitance. Why is it backwards? In a parallel, resonant circuit, the reactants the resonance means that you've got a very high uh, Shoot, I don't know. Uh, my mind is not wrapped around that one. 
Um, we're on page 163. Can I offer a comment? Uh, please. It's, it comes from the mathematics involved, which are too deep for this discussion. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, that because the parallelism in, in, uh, when you do your math for the, the parallel components for your LC networks, because it's inverted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the resistance in a parallel uh, network is going to be really, really high, and the the uh, um, and the series resistance in the series network is really low in the resonant circuits. Yeah, and a parallel resonant circuit on either side of resonance, uh, the uh, impedance drops off very quickly, but at the resonant frequency, the inductance and the capacitance uh, basically block the signal path to ground. Right which is why you have the highest voltage built up in a parallel resonant tank. We That's right. Parallel LC, a tank in the old tube days. And knowing some about tube circuits helps understanding of some of these concepts. Yeah. Q of a parallel resonance circuit is resistance divided by the reactance. And I don't have a real world example to compare that to, but uh, that's the way you answer the question. Uh, 5A15, which of the following increases Q for inductors and capacitances? And the lower the losses, the higher the Q. It's that simple. And uh, Q is for a specific uh, frequency. So uh, it has nothing to do with self-resonant frequencies of the inductors or capacitance. And it... Uh, uh, it just has to, the Q has to do with the uh, the lowest loss possible, the higher Q, which is the desirable quality for uh, most tuned circuits. Uh, you attain that by getting the lowest loss you can in the capacitors and the inductors, which five uh, A thirteen. What is an an effect of increasing the Q in a resonant circuit. And the answer is internal voltages increase. Uh, doesn't have anything to do with the number of components. It doesn't have anything to do with parasitic effects. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, phase shift. It's just the uh, internal voltages across the inductance and capacitance. Okay, now we're gonna deal with uh, bandwidth for resonant circuits. Uh, the uh, next couple of questions actually ask for a computation. What is the half power bandwidth of a resonant circuit that has a resonant frequency of 7.1 megahertz and a Q of 150? Uh, 
What page are we on now? 160. 164. Yeah, I'm on 163. That's, uh, if you look at the uh, half hour bandwidth chart on page 164, <laughs> um, the half power bandwidth is the point at which the uh, level is the square root of two half the square root of two uh, which is uh, uh, shown in that chart with a being the gain at mid band and then the bandwidth being the difference between those half power points on that uh, curve and uh, West goes through some of the calculations on how you get the 3 dB point on the curve there. Uh, you don't need that to answer these questions uh, because the half power point is related to Q in that the bandwidth is the frequency, center frequency divided by Q. So on this question, you've got, as you see down at the bottom of the, of the page, 7.1 megahertz divided by 150. And when you do that, uh, you're going to come out with 47.3 kilohertz. as the answer. And if you do that in your head, uh, you know, 7.1 divided by 100 would be 100 kilohertz and no, would be 70 kilohertz. And uh, one and a half times that the approximation is going to come out to 47.3 of those numbers, not 23.67 or the higher numbers. Does that make sense? You can actually take your calculator and do the, ca do the calculations uh, or you can do it in your head. How you come out with that identification of C is really going to be up to you. But the formula is bandwidth is frequency divided by Q. And in the question pool, we've got another one of those 3.7 megahertz and a Q of 118. And again, it's 34, 31 kilohertz. What is the resonant uh, frequency of an RL circuit? If R is equal to uh, 22 ohms, L is equal to 50 microhenries, and C is equal to 40 picofarads. And on page 165, you've got that formula. Uh, in the bottom of this, frequency is equal 10 to the 6. That's frequency in megahertz. No, frequency in kilohertz. 10 to the 6th over uh, 2 pi on times the square root of L times C. So you take 50 and 40 times.
times one another, it's 200 square root of 200. is uh, one point four one four and you multiply that one point four by two point by twenty two ohms. No the twenty two ohms doesn't come into it. Uh, anyway you apply that formula and you come out with uh, um, as he does in the book, uh, 3560, uh, megahertz as the answer. Does everybody understand the process of getting there on this one and the formula to use? Okay, we're gonna move on. Um, 5A16, what is the resonant frequency of an RLC circuit? If R is 33 ohms, L is 50 microhenries, and C is 10 picofarads. And again, you plug the inductance and capacitance. The resistance doesn't play a part in it uh, as far as the resonance is concerned. And uh, in this case, it comes out to be 7.12 megahertz. And if you're using your slide rule, don't confuse the megahertz with kilohertz. Okay, 5B01. What is the term for the time required for a capacitor in an RC circuit? to be charged to 63.2% of the applied voltage or to discharge to 36.8% of its initial value. That is by definition, the time constant. I don't know what an exponential rate of one is. I don't know what an exponential period is. Uh, and I, you know, the time factor is I've really messed up the explanation of that, haven't I? No, sounds good to me. <clears throat> that is the definition. Look at the next page, 166. Tells you all about time constants and the values at numbers of time constants. Mm -hmm. That's a quick shorthand method to use yeah, and it uses graphic uh, uh, hyperbolic curves for discharge and charge of capacitances. Right, yes, of RC circuits. And so time constant, if you're charging the capacitor from total discharge, uh, it's... Uh, 63.2% of the applied voltage and on discharge, it's 63.8%. Um, 
if you look out at the, those hyperbolic curves on page 166, uh, the rule of thumb for a totally charged capacitor is five time constants. And totally charged capacitor is, again, five time constants. And you see the points on the curve where, where that's the case, where it's at five time constants, it's 99.3% and it's 0.07% of the total charge. Okay, um, 5B04. What is the time constant of a circuit having two 22, 220 microfarad capacitors and two one mega ohm resistors in parallel? The two uh, microfarad capacitors. Uh, if they're all in parallel, the value of the capacitors is 440 microfarads and two me one meg ohm resistors in parallel will be half a meg ohm. So you multiply uh, the resistance times the capacitance uh, and the resistance is half a meg ohm and uh, 440 uh, uh, microfarads uh, gives you answer D, which is 220 seconds. And in this case, you can do that in your head because you basically take half of the 440 seconds. Okay, E5D01, talking about skin effects. And basically skin effect has to do with the way uh, RF currents flow in a piece of solid copper wire. And the uh, skin effect says that the higher the frequency, the, the thinner the layer around the, uh, of the current flowing in the outer part of the, of the conductor. So it flows on the skin of the conductor. Um, so what is the result of the skin effect? As frequency increases, RF current flows in a thinner and thinner layer of conductor closer to the surface. Uh, one of the impacts of that is that the effective resistance of the uh, conductor is removed uh, or is increased. Um, so, that can mean things if you're drawing a lot of current in terms of the loss in that conductor. And uh, it's frequency increasing the thinner the layer of the conductor that is closer to the surface that is being used. It's not frequency decreasing, it's increasing. A DC current would flow all through the conductor and the really higher frequencies would just move out to that little shell of stuff on the outside. Thermal effects, uh, it's not, has nothing to do with uh, skin effect, except that the loss might have some Well, won't go there. The thermal effects are just uh, imaginary answers to fill in the space, I think. If you have a half dipole antenna, 
what would the difference be between using stranded wire or solid wire with the surface effect? Uh, the stranded wire probably would have uh, more loss than the the uh, solid wire, but uh, both are used in antennas. Uh, it's probably not enough to worry about less than an S unit of way less than an S unit, maybe a dB or so or less even uh, between stranded and solid. Uh, one of the real questions that I have is I'm building a, uh, I've got the toroids to do it, but I haven't bought the wire yet to build a, a nine to one ballon for an in-fed antenna. And uh, the design that I'm looking at calls for number 16 wire. I can find all kinds of number 16 wire in uh, uh, stranded, but I can't find very many, very much of it in uh, solid conductor. I can buy a, uh, a thousand feet, but I need about 10 feet of it for the, <laughs> for what I'm using it for. Um, and, uh, the question comes to me, should I use the solid wire or should I use the stranded wire? And my instinct tells me I want to use the solid wire. So I'm still looking. I haven't bought the wire yet. Uh, 5D02, why is it important to keep lead lengths short for components used in circuits for VHF and above? The answer is B, to avoid unwanted inductive reactants. Every wire, every wire has uh, inductance. And the longer the wire, the more inductance. So at VHF frequencies, uh, the length becomes a larger part of uh, uh, a wavelength and that inductive reactants uh, can mess up the tuning. It can lead to uh, uh, lots of microphonics and all kinds of stuff. And it has nothing to do with maintaining uh, component life. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, a thermal time constant. It's just to avoid an, uh, inductive reactants. And obviously, since two of the answers are wrong, D is not correct either. What is a, what is microstrip? Uh, microstrip is used in, uh, VHF, UHF, and uh, microwave frequencies. It uses the concept of the theories around transmission lines to uh, uh, provide constant impedance to interconnect, interconnect uh, circuits. And uh, it uh, the uh, transmission line is the ground plane plus the uh, printed circuit uh, wires. Very stable, no microphonics or anything of that kind because it's all there tight on the board. And uh, the rest of the answer is lightweight transmission line uh, made of common zip cord. That may work very well at 40 meters. I used it as a novice. Uh, miniature coax 
used for low power applications. The little tiny stuff with an SMA connector on it. Nope, 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 nope. That's not what microstrip is. It's a strip of conductor on a printed circuit board. And it's not coax. It's a strip of, it's a conductor on a circuit board. Okay, why are short connections used in microwave frequencies? In microwave frequencies, an inch can be uh, a sizable portion of a wavelength. And so you get phase shift along the, the connections. The shorter the connection, the less the phase shift. has nothing to do with neutralizing resistance, compensating capacitance, or noise figure. Five D O six. In what direction is the magnetic field oriented about a conductor in relation to the direction of electron flow? Now that's an interesting question. I didn't read that that way before. Um, I'm personally gonna have to reflect on this because I don't know that that's a good question. Uh, I think it's one that should be thrown out of the pool, frankly. <laughs> well, it's a good question, it's just, worded weird and different than what you normally get. Well, the it's, you know, the question of current, we don't use uh, electron flow current. No, it's backwards from conventional current. Right. Um, <clears throat> and conventional current, um, The answer to this question is still valid. Uh, you know, it's in a circle around the conductor. And if you take your left hand and bend your fingers out, like so, left hand, I've got a mirror image here, so it looks like my right hand, but it's left hand. If your thumb is pointing in the direction of the current flow, the magnetic field is in the direction of your fingers. And it becomes a circle around the conductor. Um, that answer is true whether you're talking about electron flow or current flow which are two opposite things. So when you get to this question, think about left-handed and where the magnetic field is. It's in your fingers. It goes around the, the conductor. Well, the, the thing about the question is it doesn't ask which direction around the conductor is the magnetic field lines. I mean, whether you use your left hand or right hand tracking electrons or no, or conventional positive current flow, the magnetic field is always in a circle around the conductor. That's right. That's what's funny about this question because they, he should have shown you the normal conventional way of doing this called the right hand rule where you use your right hand and like John explained, demonstrated curl your fingers around the conductor with your finger with your thumb pointed in the direction of the conventional positive current which if you're interested in which way the electrons are going it's just the opposite way and i mean everything when we get to the antenna section it's the same thing it's the right hand screw rule which is the same illustration and this is going to confuse everybody <laughs> this is a comment to Gordon West saying, 
this is totally confusing and it has nothing to do with the answer that he's wanting to get. Well, and in this question, it's not Gordon's, uh, it's not Gordon West's question. This is a question from the volunteer examiner coordinators. Well, well in my opinion, they totally blew this question. Yeah, they ought to throw that one out, but it, it's in well, the test, the, gentlemen. <laughs> the, 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 the question the answer, and the answer makes answer sense. Does, yeah, the answer. But, does but, but not, Gordon's diagram and explanation of it is, is confusing. Because yeah. just like, uh, uh, sorry, I can't remember his name right now. <laughs> just drawing a blank. Wayne. John Wayne. Yeah, John Wayne said, I'm just a right-hand rule. And that's ex exactly what I, I even wrote down, right-hand rule. <laughs> and I, wait, scratch out the left-hand rule. I've never heard left-hand rule. <laughs> no. Well, the, 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 the trick is that, that phrase, electron flow, uh, West was smart enough to pick up on that. But, uh, you know, uh, you know. But it has nothing to do with the answer. That's my whole contention. Yeah, what difference, you know, you know, the answer is a circle around the conductor, and that's true uh, for either electron flow or conventional current. Uh, it's, you know, and left hand, right hand, who cares, you know, as far as this question is concerned. It, right. The, the answer is the way your fingers circle around the conductor. Yeah. And where you point your thumb is depending on which <laughs> electrons or, or conventional positive current flow. Yeah, and it's north to south magnet stuff that you're talking about. Right. Okay. That's, that's how you would sort that out, but that's not this question. Yeah, and uh, messing up the, or getting back to business. Top of page 169 is where we are next. Yeah, E6D04. Uh, what materials are commonly used as core, as a core for inductance? And this is an interesting question uh, because the answer is B, ferrite uh, and brass. Uh, let's look at this a minute. Polystyrene and polyethylene are plastics. Uh, they may be used as a coil form for an inductor, but they're not a core as such. Uh, Teflon and Delrin uh, are insulated materials. They could also be used as a coil form, I guess, although Teflon is... Uh, crazy stuff. Cobalt and aluminum. Uh, aluminum uh, has zero ferromagnetic properties. Cobalt, nickel, and steel are the three metals that are most notably ferromagnetic. Uh, but cobalt is uh, rather expensive in metallic form. So the answer, the common, commonly used core of an inductor, uh, which has some uh, uh, effect on the uh, inductance of the inductor are ferrite and brass. Ferrite increases it and brass decreases the value of the conductor. West has a comment here that says that uh, brass has been used in really high power um, broadcast transmitters uh, to change the inductance of the some of the coils in those transmitters. Uh, but has little use in ham radio. And I don't know that I've ever seen a, a brass slug in a, in a, in a ham, uh, in, in, in any ham equipment. D, uh, D11, what type of core material 
decreases the inductance which is inserted into the coil when it is inserted into the coil. I just answered that one. It's brass. Uh, and the, the key here is the decreases. Uh, ferrite and powdered iron will increase it. Uh, ceramic depends on what it's made of, how it's put together. Um, 6D12, what is inductor saturation? If you increase the voltage in an inductor that has a an iron core, uh, in a power supply, the uh, point will be reached where that core gets extremely hot because it stops storing magnetic energy in the uh, magnetic field and begins dissipating that energy in the core. And uh, when that happens, the process is called saturation. And the uh, answer to this question is C, the ability, it, uh, inductor's saturation is when you exceed the core's ability to store magnetic energy. Uh, it has nothing to do with overcoupled windings. It has nothing to do with the uh, with flashover. It does have to do something to do with the increase in voltage. Uh, uh, capabilities, but it, it doesn't, you don't have to get the flash over to get the saturation in the core and adjacent inductors uh, have nothing to do with it. It's the saturation because it's no longer storing all of the energy in the magnetic field. Um, 6D13, what is the primary cause of inductor self-resonance. When I was doing research and development into switching regulators, I had a, a coil that I used uh, to isolate the transistor that was doing the switching uh, from the filter capacitor on the output and I discovered that I had all kinds of RFI coming out of that coil. And the reason was that it had a self-resonance and that self-resonance had to do with the inter-turn capacitance. Because when you put two pieces of metal together side by side, there is a capacitance there. And so that's how you get self-resonance. Skin effect has nothing to do with it. Uh, inductive kickback is the spark you get when you uh, shut off a, a choke and uh, measure the voltage on it when the current stops. Nonlinear core hysteresis is beyond the technical capabilities or technical uh, information necessary here. Okay, 5D09. We're gonna have to move right along. What happens to reactive power in an AC circuit that has both ideal inductors and ideal capacitors?
The reactive power is repeatedly exchanged between the magnetic field of the inductors and the electric fields of the capacitors. If they're ideal, they have no resistance and nothing in them but uh, inductance and capacitors. And the energy is not, the power is not dissipated. The energy is not dissipated. So heat in the circuit is not there. Kinetic energy in the circuit is not there. It's not a motor, it's an LC, it's a uh, inductive capacitive uh, circuit. And it is not dissipated when it forms inductive and capacitive fields, magnetic and capacitive fields. So the answer is B. In the real world, that's kind of hard to imagine because there, if you put power into a, a, an LC circuit, it's going to be dissipated because of the innate resistance in the wires. How can true power be determined in an AC circuit where the voltage and current are out of phase? And the answer is by multiplying the apparent power by the power factor. The apparent power is the current being drawn by the circuit um, times the voltage across the circuit. And in a reactive uh, um, in a reactive circuit, the uh, uh, Apparent power uh, can be quite a bit more than the actual power that's dissipated. And the, the factor is the power factor. So you multiply the uh, voltage times the current times the power factor to get the uh, true power. Now we get to use that little fact. What is the power factor of an RL circuit having a 60 degree phase angle between the voltage and the current? And here's one I want to go back to the book on. Uh, where are we now? 170. Super. You see the uh, the formula there uh, on the previous question, or between the previous question and this one. Uh, And uh, if you calculate that 60 degree phase angle, uh, Uh, 
Hey, John. Yeah. Uh, instead of these calculations, it's just a few little tricks you need to remember for the uh, phase angle and the power factor. Yeah, it's, it covers that in the under this question, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, the cosine of the angle. Uh, uh, the cosine of 60 degrees is 0. 0.5. Uh, the cosine of uh, 45 degrees is 0. 0.707, which is the uh, uh, half of the square root of two, actually. Yes. And uh, 30 degrees is uh, uh, listed here as 0.866. And so you've got those, those numbers with the 60 degree phase angle, the cosine is, uh, is uh, 0.5 which gives you the power factor for uh, for this, which is the way you get at that answer. Uh, and West's uh, shortcut there is a good one. And then D12 is the same thing. Uh, and again, the answer here is C, which is 0.866, because we're talking about a 30 degree phase angle. And then you get the question, how many watts is consumed by a circuit having a power factor of 0.71? If the apparent power is 500 volt amps. Now, it's not 500 watts, it's 500 volt amps because this is AC circuitry. Uh, and uh, the uh, answer to this is clearly multiplying the 500 volts amps times the 0 0.71, which uh, comes out to 355 watts. And it's math you can do in your head if you know what you're doing, or you can use the calculator, but it's power factor times the uh, volt amperage and you get three, the 355. You get a parallel question to this, how many watts is consumed in a circuit if the power factor is 0 0.6 and the input is uh, 200 volt say C at five amperes, uh, 200 volts times five gives you a thousand volt amperes and a power factor of 0. 0.6 gives you 600 watts, which is easy to calculate without doing the calculator. The difference between these two questions is here they gave you the volt amp uh, thing and a thousand point volt amps uh, has to be calculated in 5D08. And then 5D12 is how many watts is consumed in a circuit with a power factor of 0.2 with an input of 100 volts AC and four amperes. Uh, 100 volts AC times four uh, gives you 400 uh, volt amps and 0.2 times 400 is 80 watts, which gives the answer B, simple enough.
question. Why do power companies not like uh, low power factor loads? And the answer is you've got all this current flowing uh, for 80 watts of dissipation and that current on their transmission lines uh, meets the resistance on those transmission lines and causes voltage drops and energy loss. So power companies uh, prefer power factors of 0.9 or higher. Useless information nobody needs for the test, but I thought I would throw it in there just for the joy of it and to show off. Okay, 5D13, how many watts is consumed by a circuit consisting of a 100 ohm resistor in series with a 100 ohm inductive reactants drawing one ampere? A little more complicated uh, calculation here. Uh, the reactance is uh, or the impedance is 200 ohms. Uh, drawing one ampere uh, if you get confused by the 200 ohms impedance, you nope. would think it would nope. disappear to 100 watts, but you don't want to get confused because it's all dissipated in that 100 ohm resistor. So one ampere times 100 ohms. Uh, no, it's I squared R. I squared one ampere. This is really uh, confusing to learning about this particular thing. The one ampere squared is one ampere, one square ampere times 100 ohms, which gives you answer B, which is 100 watts. and a power factor of 0.5. Okay, 5D14, what is reactive power? And it is wattless non-productive power. It's the power that's used in building electric and uh, uh, magnetic fields with no useful things being done other than that. Uh, 5D15, uh, what is the power factor of an RL circuit having a 45 degree phase angle between the voltage and the current? And again, you talk about the cosine of the phase angle uh, and the being the power factor, the cosine of a 45 degree angle is 0.707. Or the square root of two or the square root of two. That's a trigonometry problem if you want to know why it's the square root of two, but it's simple to do if you want to do it. It's Pythagorean theorem. Okay, 4E04. How can conducted and radiated noise caused by a automobile alternator be suppressed. You get this whiny that changes with the speed of the engine. How do you get rid of it? And 
they suggest connect the radio's power leads directly to the battery so that you don't get voltage drops along the current along the uh, lines to the radio in the car and uh, install capacitors coaxial capacitors in line <coughs> with the alternator leads to short the uh, noise to ground how do you distinguish that from the other answers in this one uh, so filter capacitors in series with a dc power line will result in nothing it'll block the DC to the radio by installing a noise suppression resistance and blocking capacitor in both leads. You don't want resistors in your power leads. By installing a high pass filter in series with the radio's power lead and a low pass filter in parallel with the field lead. Uh, that's a very, very complex suggestion and has nothing to do with reality. I don't know why anybody would even try something as silly as that. Not only that, but with the amperage you're going to be pulling with your mobile radio, you're probably going to be one of using it. You're not going to want to use the car's wiring anyway to run your radio and stuff. You're going to want, you're going to want, 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 going to Yeah, am I unmuted now? I hear you. Good. Thank you, Charles. Uh, and thank you, uh, Wayne. Appreciate your rescuing us from that uh, loop wherever it was coming from. Um, anyway, in this question, uh, um, yeah, if I'm running 100 watts or more, I want to be connected because you're talking 40 amps, 30, well, 20 amps or so uh, on a 100 watt rig. Uh, you want to be connected directly to the battery and not going through the others because you're going to get all kinds of stuff happening if you don't, including blowing the fuses. Um, 4E5, uh, gentlemen, we've got uh, seven questions left, and we're going to go over just a little bit. Is that going to be okay? I hope. I don't want to unmute everybody to get an answer to that. If you, well, raising a hand is not easy to do in this configuration with the screen share. Um, so we're going to go over f five minutes, probably. How can radio frequency interference from an AC motor be suppressed? And the answer they give is by using a brute force AC line filter in series with the motor leads.
A bypass capacitor will stop the motor from running. A high pass filter in series uh, with the power leads. Uh, don't know what that accomplishes. Uh, and the ground fault current interrupter. Uh, does nothing for the noise. Might make the operation of the motor erratic. So it's a brute force AC line filter that ne is needed there. Uh, 6D08, what is one reason for using powdered iron cores rather than ferrite cores in an inductor? And the answer is B. Uh, the iron core uh, maintain their characteristics at higher currents. Uh, ferrite cores could have heating problems if you were running high currents and changing things. Um, initial permeability is not the issue. Uh, the number of turns in the cores is not the issue, and a smaller diameter wire for the same inductance. Uh, inductance is not dependent on the wire diameter particularly. There are some factors there, but it's not the primary thing. So it's uh, for higher currents, powdered iron cores are the way to go. What is one reason for using ferrite cores rather than powdered iron in an inductor. And they say, C, toroids generally require fewer turns to produce the given, fair, given inductance value, which means you're gonna get a higher Q because you have fewer turns and less resistance. Uh, has nothing to do with surface mount technology, has nothing to do with temperature stability, and nothing to do with permeability, the uh, initial permeability. Uh, 6D06, what core material properly determines what core material properly property determines the inductance of an inductor? The answer is permeability. Um, in the formulas for inductance, uh, permeability is, is one of the factors that's in that equation. And uh, for ferrite cores, sometimes they just give you a uh, factor and you take that factor and multiply it by the number of turns and it gives you the inductance in microhenries. Uh, what is the primary, what is a primary advantage for using a toroid core instead of a solenoid core? Toroid core is a donut Solenoid core is a, is a uh, piece, of, is a, just a line uh, of uh, core. And uh, the answer is A, the toroid cores can find most of the magnetic field within the core material. Uh, there's a old wives tale that toroid cores completely uh, uh, shield themselves, and there's no coupling outside of the toroid. That's not quite true, but it's much, much less for toroid cores. Uh, toroid cores do make it more difficult to couple in ma couple magnetic energy into other components. Uh, hysteresis has nothing to do with it, uh, and. Uh, Lower Q characteristics has nothing to do with it. The advantage is in that uh, magnetic field in the core. What should 
core saturation of an impedance matching why should core saturation of an impedance matching transformer be avoided? And the answer has to do with harmonics and distortion can result. Um, for example, if you had a, uh, toroid that you were going to make a nine to one balance out of, and you exceeded, ran too much power into that, uh, ballon and exceeded the, and pushed that core into saturation, you've got a nonlinear device, nonlinear devices allow for intermod and harmonics and distortion and all kinds of stuff. And that's why you should avoid uh, core saturation. Um, the magnetic flux uh, is, that's not a RF susceptance is not an issue. Uh, temporary changes in core permeability could result. That's not your issue. The issue is the harmonics and distortion. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to say about that, but I've forgotten what it is. Oh, uh, core saturation usually will result in uh, the heating of the core. One of the ways of knowing... Uh, that you're in that kind of a mode is if you come and find the core in your uh, ballon extremely hot, it's probably dissipating stuff in saturation. And that, gentlemen, is it. We're five minutes over, six minutes over.